you're going to come around the table. The ushers would like to come forward. This is what Jesus did on the cross for us. And he commanded us to do this in remembrance of him. Anytime we come around the table, we do it in remembrance of him. In remembrance of what he did on the cross for us. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't even be here today. It's true, the cross that has paved the way for us. That today we are called children of God. Sons and daughters of God. So I'm going to read a scripture from 1 Corinthians 11, 23. It says, Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This too, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the word. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together, you come together for judgment. And the, and the rest he said but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest I will set in order when I come amen, amen. as the scripture says brothers and sisters if we will judge ourselves we will not be judged. So I want us to examine ourselves right now. Before we come to this sacred table, this is something God, Jesus did. And he said, whenever we do this, we should do it in remembrance of him. We are remembering what he did on the cross for us. The salvation that you and I have today. The peace we have. The deliverance, the healing, the forgiveness. Just let us examine ourselves for a few minutes. So Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you that your body that was broken for us, your blood that was shed for the remission of sin. Today, even as we come around the table and dine with you, we ask that whatever law that is not right in our bodies, as we drink and eat this by faith, will be removed completely, just as you did on the cross for us. The power of sin was broken because of what you did. And we declare in the name of Jesus, that these are no longer mere emblems, but these emblems are your body and your blood that was shed for us. So we drink and we eat this by faith, knowing what you have already achieved and accomplished on the cross for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please go ahead. When you receive the bread, go ahead and eat it.
but hold on to the cup. We will drink it together. Amen.
Mein Gott, der Kraft. Halleluja. Thank you, Jesus. Such an anointing in the presence of God in the house. So, brothers and sisters, there's such a corporate anointing. Anything can happen. If you have come here with any infirmity, believe as you drink this by faith that by the time you leave this place, that infirmity will leave your body. If you have come here with any oppression, any depression, as we drink this by faith, believe that that oppression will leave you alone in the name of Jesus. Because Christ has already paid the price on the cross for you. You don't need to go through that pain. You don't need to go through that agony. You don't need to go through that affliction. I release this by faith. And in the name that is above every other name, receive your healing. Receive your deliverance. Receive your freedom. As we drink this by faith. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's just drink it together. Amen. Amen. Pastor Ian is going to come and introduce our guest speaker. Let's welcome him as he comes. Thank you, Pastor Danny. Praise the Lord. Yeah, um, another important notice. On the 16th of March, we have a leaders and workers meeting. And our guest speaker is Hugh Osgood. Uh, so if you're a leader or a worker in New Life, it's here from 10 till 1, okay? Well, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Clem Ferris with us. Uh, I'll introduce him. I looked up uh, about, and uh, if I gave the full introduction, we'd be here for half an hour. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Clem Ferris travels full-time in the ministry and missions from his home base in Grace Church in Chapel Hill, which is in North Carolina. He's based in a church of about 1,700. He's been traveling for over 30 years, equipping the saints uh, as a mobile ministry. He's a church consultant, conference speaker, and Bible teacher. He's not only a prophet, he's a teacher as well. He has a BA and MA, and also a doctorate from Jacksonville Theological Seminary. Uh, him and his wife, Jane, have four children and five grandchildren, and he's ministered in at least 45 nations and has a particular burden for the British Isles. So stretch your hands towards him. Denise, just pray for him, please, and his family. Amen. Let's we welcome Clem Ferris. Well, it's good morning in North Carolina. It's still morning there. So good morning and good afternoon. It's really good to be with you. Great to meet your pastor. Well, your former pastor. Does that sound funny? He's not the pastor anymore. I got to be really nice to this guy. This is an exciting time for you as a church. Prophets love transition. Oh, we love change. I call apostles and prophets change technicians. God gives them the technology to say certain words at certain times that bring change and transition. And so you're in a really good season. It's a good time to be here. Glad to be here. Thanks for the sunshine. Wow. And uh, thank you for that nice. I got tired just listening about myself. It's like, I did all that. So, yeah, I base out of a wonderful church in North Carolina. I'm a governing elder there. We have a, just a great team there. Before that, I pastored down in the state of Florida. So I was in pastoral ministry many years. 
But I started coming to the UK in 1988. I made my first trip 35 years ago. And um, God just put such a burden in my heart for the British Isles. And so I'm in the UK and British Isles probably three or four times a year. And um, met some wonderful people over the years. What's amazing, I'm 100% from the north of Ireland. All my grandparents came from Northern Ireland. So if you hear me lift the end of my sentences, it's because I'm from Northern <laughs> Ireland. So, but I won't torture you with that. But, and it was a, a great joy, 1988, to go to uh, Northern Ireland for my first time. And I got to see the house my grandparents came from. And God just put such a burden in my heart for all the British Isles. And so I love coming here. And interestingly, on this trip, I'll be back up in Hereford. And um, that was the first church I ever came to with Dr. David Blomgren who was my pastor at the time, and I'm going back there, and I go there all the time, but I'm now working with three generations of the same family that invited me over. So I'll be, I'll be staying with the granddad who had the church. I'll be ministering with the son's network called Freedom Churches, and then uh, his son, his oldest son, planted in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, relationships are so important. Amen. I, the older we get, the more you value relationships, right? And so it's the greatest thing. It's what you get to take to heaven. You get to take all your relationships to heaven. So don't mess them up down here because you're going to have to sort it out up there. <laughs> Some of you think, I'm just going to wait to heaven to forgive that person. No, <laughs> you may not get in. So take care of it now. That was a word for somebody. I didn't even plan that. We're on the flow already. All right. So because I've been traveling so much over the years, uh, during COVID, I didn't travel for four months straight. That's the longest I'd ever been in my house in one stretch in 25 years. <laughs> and I'm still married. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 42 years in May. Wonderful yeah. wife, wonderful wife. But during that time, um, I wrote a book, um, which I was fulfilling a prophecy I'd gotten about writing. And the book that I wrote was on stewarding prophecy. Because being in prophetic ministry all these years, one of my other burdens is not just to deliver a prophetic word to equip and encourage, but also to teach people how to steward that word so it can come to fulfillment. Amen. There's a lot of people that get discouraged, churches, pastors, and the saints. They get frustrated, discouraged, impatient when a word doesn't come to pass in their timing. And they don't really realize what's going on in that season where nothing's happening. <laughs> so they think. So I want to encourage you today, with, we'll just do a short teaching on how to steward prophecy, what it's all about. So we'll start in the book of Revelation. How many like the book of Revelation? Yeah. How many get excited when a prophet says, turn to the book of Revelation? Yeah. We won't stay long. <laughs> in the beginning of the book of Revelation, which is, yeah, the whole Bible is a prophetic book. We know that. But this is particularly a prophetic writing by the Apostle John. And he starts out in what we call the prologue of the book. Chapter 1 in verse 3, and he says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. See, John actually calls it a prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So that's the opening that John gives us. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and keep. Say keep. Oh, you're a talking church. I like talking churches. God really wants talking churches, okay? I grew up in the Anglican church. How many know Anglican churches? Yeah? In America, they're called the Episcopal church, but we just call them God's chosen frozen. <laughs> Amen? I'm just kidding. I can pick on myself. 25 years as an acolyte, I lit candles and wore a little red dress. I did all this stuff, you know, but I didn't know Jesus till later. So there's hope. There's hope for your adult kids. That's for somebody. You're still praying for your adult children? Keep praying. Amen. I think God totally wrecked my plans and wrecked my world and brought me in the kingdom. Amen. All by himself. <laughs> and probably the prayers of my mother. Anyway, keep praying. So this was such an important instruction about how to get a hold of this book that John repeats it at the very end of the book of Revelation, or we say even the end of the Bible, chapter 22, verse 7, which now we call the... The, the epilogue, we have the prologue and the epilogue, the same wording, it's in red, if you have a red letter edition, where Jesus said, blessed are those who keep the word of the Lord. So what does it mean to keep a word? To keep it. 
It's a powerful word in the Greek. It's the word tereo. And in the, in the Greek, that word tereo means to watch over something. So it's a, there's something visual about keeping. Keeping the word of the Lord means you keep your eyes on it. Watch over it so that it won't be lost or stolen. Ah. It's valuable. It can be stolen. Because we have an enemy. His nickname is a thief. <laughs> Amen. How many know the devil hates prophecy? The, hev- the devil hates any word that comes out of God's mouth. The written word and the spoken word. To watch over something so that it won't be lost or stolen. It also, it was used in secular Greek to, to ward off an enemy. Keep it. What? Guard. Watch it. Watch. Ward off an enemy. We have an enemy. It also means to bring something to fulfillment. You keep it until it's done. Keep it until it is fulfilled. That's all in that one word, tereo. So when he says, blessed are the ones who keep the words, we have to keep words of prophecy. There's a blessing in that, but there's a battle in it. There's never a blessing without a battle. Come on, somebody. There's always going to be a battle over the word of the Lord. And so we, you, we, we learn how to fight the good fight. So we have to wage warfare. Now, in the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13, let me just look at verse 19. Matthew 13 is the great parable of the sower. And, you know, the, the four soils and the destination of the word is the heart of man, and Jesus teaches all that. And then the, he gets all done, and like a good disciple, they're looking at Jesus and scratching their head and going, could you explain what you just said? How, come on, how, how many of you read your Bible and go, Lord, would you just explain what I just read because I didn't? I'm, I'm there. I was there this morning. I was reading something going, could you please explain? One time Jesus said this, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I think Jesus kind of like, you, you are, are you getting this? And he said, okay, let me explain then the parable of the sower. He says, hear then the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 18. And the first thing he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, a prophecy is a word from the kingdom. It doesn't originate in earth. doesn't originate in the mind of a human. It's from another dimension, from another realm. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, watch the next phrase, and understands it not... Then comes the wicked one, and he snatches away that which was sown in his heart. Isn't that interesting? That's a picture of the warfare Jesus is trying to describe to his disciples when they said, what's this parable of the sower, sowing the word? What's it all about? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, which is a word from the king, when the king talks, and then here's the catchphrase, and understands it not. Now, this is going to be good news for some of you, because you think, well, that's my problem. I didn't go to Bible college. I'm not a theologian. I'm not very smart and all this. I have a good news for you. It has nothing to do with human intelligence, that kind of understanding. It's the Greek word sunami, sunami, interesting word. This idea of sunami would best be saying the convergence of two opposite things coming from different directions. The best picture for sunami, I mean, yeah, it really means like to come together to converge, to meet, to meet upon each other, simply means to happen and meet. So a picture of sunami would be if you had two streams of water, one flowing this way, one flowing this way, and they flow towards each other and meet and maybe form some new river, that place where those two streams come together and meet, that's sunami, happening upon each other. If Danny was standing over there and Pastor Ian there and they walked across the room and met here in the middle and shook hands, that moment they met, Soon am I. So when the word of the Lord comes to you, there has to be this place of reception, Amen. not understanding. I don't understand. Don't have to. Just got to allow it to happen upon you. Right. And the reason that doesn't sometimes, first of all, is because people have their own list of expectations. God, I need you to speak to me. And here are my three conditions. <laughs> God, I need a word from you. And it better be this, this, or this. <laughs> And then when the word comes, it doesn't happen upon you. It un- you don't understand it. Why? Because it doesn't meet your expectation. It doesn't meet your, <laughs> your ideas. And so, you know what happens? That word comes, and then if you don't sunami it, then comes the wicked one. How many of the devil, devil's watching prophetic words? Yes. He's all eyes and ears. What's God going to say to that one? I'm going to have to battle. Because <laughs> prophecy can change your life. It can change things. The number one goal of prophecy is say, why does prophecy even exist? For one reason, to make you more like Christ. 
makes you Christ-like. All the fivefold ministries are all dimensions of Christ that are to be gotten into the saints to form them into the image of Christ. Prophecy forms Christ in you, and the devil doesn't like that. He's trying to form himself in you. So when he says, then comes the wicked one to snatch away that which is sown in his heart. Now, that's a strong warfare word in the Greek language. That word snatch away is harpazo. Say harpazo. And really hit that second syllable, harpazo. Doesn't that feel good coming out of your mouth like, ah, har- harpazo. Go harpazo. You, now you think, the devil's going to harpazo. It means to seize something by force in warfare. That's what that word means, to seize hold of something. And you think, the audacity of the devil. Why does he think he can come and snatch a word from me? Where did he get that idea? That's where he gets anything. He steals it. There's nothing original in the devil. He's a copycat and a thief. He's a counterfeiter. <laughs> where did he get the idea of harpazo? From the Bible. Who's supposed to be doing all the harpazoing? We are. Because if you go back just a couple of chapters in Matthew, and you know this verse, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent... Now say it in the Greek. The the violent ones, harpazo. See? You're all Greek students now. You impress your friends. How was church? Oh, it was harpazo, man. It was harpazo. (laughs) We just took every word by force. But you see, the... That's for us. We're to, it says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent ones, that's us. We seize the kingdom by force. What's the force? Our words. This whole thing's a battle of words, everybody. Our whole life is a battle of words. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it won't stop till he comes. But it's a battle of words. So we have to learn how to seize the kingdom with the word when it comes to us so that the devil doesn't harpazo it out of our life. So this whole thing is put in this warfare motif, and Paul teaches Timothy something very important about that in his first epistle to Timothy. How do we hold on to that word so it won't get lost? It won't get stolen. The devil won't come and rip it away. Here's what Paul was teaching Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Paul's teaching Timothy because Timothy had had prophecies. In other epistle writings, he says, you know, Strip the gift that was given you by prophecy with the laying out of hands. He talks about Timothy's prophecies. And then he's teaching Timothy how to wage warfare with his prophecies because, like I said, there's no blessing. When John said, blessed is the one that keeps the word, there's no blessing without the battle. You're going to have to fight for that. So he's teaching Timothy how to do spiritual warfare with God's word. Now, this is not just just prophecy. This, this, This whole book is a book of prophecy. See, we wage warfare with this. This is the sword of the Spirit. We forget that sometimes. So here's what Paul says. He says, this charge I'm entrusting to you, Timothy, this charge. We'll stop right there. And Paul's already in military mind. That word charge is a military word. Paragaleon is the Greek word. And it means a command given to a lower-ranking officer from a higher-ranking officer. That's how he's treating it. He goes, this charge I'm giving you, Timothy, not according to Paul, not because I'm an apostle, not because I'm your spiritual father. He says what? According to the prophecy that was spoken before on you. That, say that, that purpose, what? You can wage, what kind of warfare do you want? How many know there's more than one kind? Let me tell you this, there's only two kinds. We want three kinds. There's good warfare, that's where you win. There's bad warfare, that's where you're not trying, or you're ignorant. You know what the third kind of warfare is? No warfare. That's what we really want. Guess what? There's no option. (laughs) It's going to happen. We're in a battle, everybody. We serve on a battleship, not a cruise line. We want to just, like, bring me another drink. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) fan me. I'm getting a little hot. No. No, we're not on a cruise line. We're on a battleship. And Paul's teaching Timothy right here. This charge I'm giving you, Timothy, in accordance with the prophecies made about you, that by them you can wage good warfare. Wage good warfare. A war, a good warfare. That Those two words come from the same Greek root word, strateia. It's where we get the word strategy. 
Do you know that in, embedded in every prophetic word is a divine strategy on how to win? And it just doesn't come. It's coded. God speaks in code. That's why you, for some, you get a prophecy you go, I don't, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. That's not what I wanted. And you're going, why is it? Because there's a code in there that you have to go to God and get. You can run to everybody else, but until you get down and say, God, what are you saying to me? How does this work? What do you want me to do? What must I change? Hmm. It stays kind of coded. <laughs> Number one, so the devil can't understand it. But it's also to take you up into an elevated position to do your warfare. Because it's also where we get the English word strat uh, stratosphere. This is not normal life. This is not flesh and blood. This is spiritual. That you can wage a good warfare. How? Comma. <laughs> it's not done yet. Verse 19. How do you wage good warfare? Two key things. Number one, holding it in faith. How I many know that's the end? How do I keep a prophecy? Hold on to it. Yeah. Hold it. That word hold means get your fingers around it. Hold on to it. It doesn't mean, you know, just have to write it out and put it in my Bible. But this whole idea of holding it, where? Ah, in the realm of faith. Not, not fold it up in your Bible. <laughs> holding it in the realm of faith. You know, where is that? The chamber of your faith is your heart. That's your holding tank of faith. Where do I locate my faith? Is it in my toes? Is it in my fingers? Where is it? It's in your heart. That's how you get saved. You believe in your that's your, that's your faith chamber. That's why the parable of the sower is to get the word of God in your heart. Faith comes by hearing. All right, so that's the chamber of your faith. But your mouth is the organ of your faith. How you get saved, how you make a spiritual transaction with God is you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. Boom, spiritual transaction, you're now born again. That's powerful. Some of you have done that, I hope. We can give you a chance today, if you haven't, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved if you confess it with your mouth. So this whole idea of holding your prophecy in faith is part of guarding it, part of stewarding it. You better know what it is. So we do say, yes, when you get a prophecy from God, or even if you get a revelation in your devotion time and you write it down and you meditate on it, you meditate on it, you get it inside of you. What Paul was instructing Timothy in chapter 4, verse 14, he said, don't neglect the gift that was given by prophecy with the laying out of hands. He goes, meditate upon these things. Yeah. In the Greek, I like the way he says, meditate upon these things. The Greek would say, see yourself in it. Isn't that cool? Yeah. See yourself in it. It's like, you get, you get a prophecy over someone. I see you going to the nations. I see you, you know, with foreigners, and you're going to go to the nations and all this. And you're sitting there going... I don't, I don't see myself doing that. Well, no, you don't. That's why God's telling you. <laughs> God's telling you what he sees for you, right? So you have to cooperate with the word and start seeing yourself in it. Holding faith watch, and a good conscience. This is where the real battle is. Let me describe that. This is where the real battle of concepts we have to wrestle with. And this is true for the preaching of the word, for reading your Bible, for reading a Christian book. Anything that's trying to transform you, <laughs> there'll be a battle. So this whole thing about holding faith and a good conscience, and then I'll wrap it up with that. Let me explain conscience quickly. We're a three-part being, body, soul, spirit. Yeah. We're living a body. We have a soul. We have a spirit. God is three parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're a three-part being. And then our soul has three parts, mind, will, and emotion. You all with me? Yeah. I'm saying, I didn't come here to get a lecture this morning. I'm, just, I'm trying to explain this one thing about conscience. Your spirit also has three major functions. First is fellowship. How many of you fellowship with your spirit first? You know, somebody can walk in the room for the first time. You've never met them, but they're a believer. You can have instant fellowship spiritually. I'd never met Ian until yesterday. He walked in the door. We had fellowship because our spirit's connected. Koinonia. So fellowship is a function of your spirit. Then there's intuition. You ever heard of intuition? Yeah. How many ladies have an extra large one? Yeah. God just gave us, we're going to supersize theirs. Their, why? Their husbands are going to need it. Yeah. And their kids. Come on, some of you are like, Mom, how did you know? She cheats. God tells her stuff. My kids use that all the time. How, do, how does mom always know? I go, just roll with it. She's going to know. So intuition is where you know when you don't know. 
It's intuitive. It comes from the Spirit. That's how the gifts of the Spirit operate. How you move in word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophetic, all comes out of your spirit. And then there's the conscience. The conscience, the very word means co-science, the place of two knowledges. Deep within you, in your, down in your spirit function, there's, I call it like the swinging door. It goes back and forth between conscience or between spirit and soul, between spirit and soul. And things can come in through your soul into your spirit, and things can come from your spirit back into your soul. It's the place of two knowledges. I know it in the spirit, and I know it in the natural. Conscience would be this. It's the place of agreement between your concepts and your conduct. That's why, you ever heard this phrase? Your conscience will bother you. You ever had your conscience bother you? You know why? Because your behavior isn't lining up with your concepts. <laughs> your conduct's off. It's like when you say, I'm not going to have two pieces of dessert, just one. And you have the one you go, as the British say, oh, it's so Moorish. Mm, would you like another? Yes, I think I'll have another. And you're just tucking into that second helping, and this little voice is going, what are you doing? That's your conscience. What are you doing? What? You said you were, your concept was, I'm not going to have another second dessert. But your conduct says, I'm going to have it anyway. And there's a little battle going on. You understand what I'm saying? So when God speaks... When a prophetic word comes, God is introducing very often new concepts to you. They're new to you. They're fine with him. But they're the word of the kingdom. They come out of the kingdom. They come out of the king's mouth. And they penetrate down into planet earth. And their destination is the heart of man. And those concepts come in. And if you don't allow them to sunami, the devil comes to steal those concepts. And you don't have to change. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> well, I don't bear witness with that. You, you may not. We go back to that word paragalian. This charge I'm giving you, Timothy, according to your prophecy, treat it like a command from a superior ranking officer to an inferior. I didn't serve in the natural military. I have many friends that have. The way I understand how that works, Pastor Ian, is when a superior officer gives a command to an inferior officer, help me out here. I wasn't in the military. What, let's, let's get a list going of the options. What are all our options? What are some of the possible responses when a command comes? Yes, sir? Yeah. Oh, there's got to be more. Can't we? Our sister there's going, no? Okay, so let me help you out. I have been in the army of the Lord for over 40 years. We in the army of the Lord, we have options, and they're all so spiritual. So when the command comes, you know, Lord, um, I'm going to pray about that. I'm just going to pray about that missions thing. I, I'm going to give me some time. Or, or I, you know, you know, sir, you know, general, I just don't have, don't have a witness about that command. It's not feeling it. I just don't have a witness. I, how, see, these work well in the army of the Lord. They sound so spiritual. Hey, parents, how would that work at home? Yeah? Son, what? I want you to clean your room. Uh, when I get home from work, I'm going to check it out. So before I get home... Before you get home from work, that room better be clean. Oh, okay, Dad, sure. Or, well, you know, Dad, just don't bear witness to room cleaning. I was thinking about going surfing today. Yeah. Yeah, I have a witness about surfing. <laughs> doesn't work in parenting, doesn't work in God's parenting. I mean, when Paul uses language like that, he says, don't mess around with this stuff, because why? You're going to find yourself in a warfare. And that's the rest of that phrase, verse 19. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of what? Their faith. And the word shipwreck is not ogeo. That's where we get the word to navigate. Sometimes we're having a hard time navigating the future because God's given us instructions from headquarters and we're going, not right now. I don't bear witness. I'll pray about it. And all of a sudden, we end up in a shipwreck and go, what happened? I need another prophecy. No, you don't. <laughs> it's it, rejecting the Previous ones is why you're shipwrecking right now. You're not doing what God has outlined for you to do. There's a grace to do it when he speaks to you. So let me give you three principles, then I'll finish. And by the way, I wrote a book on this. If you want the full enchilada, you can order it on Amazon. It's just called Stewarding Prophecy. But here's three things about the process. It's all about the process. Number one, if you don't engage in the process, you'll never arrive at the destination. 
when God speaks, he has a destiny. He has a destination he wants you to, to walk into and develop. He wants to develop something in you of Christ that's going to get you to where he wants you to be. But there's always a process of development. It's a process. And they're not always easy. And they're not always, you don't understand what you're doing while you're in that process sometimes. Because the prophetic is not just the delivery of a singular word. The prophetic is the process, and let me describe it for you. I call it the process of inquiry or the journey of inquiry. It's designed by God to bring you into a deeper relationship with him. Amen. Constantly asking questions. But God, why? How is that going to work? What do I need to do? Who should I talk to? You should be just bombarding God with questions. Because the Bible says we know in part, we prophesy in part, we just get a little part, little pieces, and God puts all the rest together when you go to him. Not everybody else. Not Aunt Martha. Not everybody else calling all the elders. What do you think about my prophecy? I don't know. I'm glad it's yours and not mine. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's your word from God to you. And there's so many biblical examples. Joseph is one of the greatest, right? What a great prophecy. Hey, you're... Brothers are going to bow down and worship you. It's a teenager's dream. And your parents oh, <laughs> are all going to worship you. And you go, yeah, finally. He had no idea. Yeah. No idea of the process God had to take him through. And that fulfillment came many years later, right? Here's the last thing. What begins as insight, often into the future, has to eventualize itself in some kind of new action, some new thoughts, new concepts, and new personal dealings. Starts as insight. I need a prophetic word. I want to know my future. Okay, God, let me have it. And he starts putting stuff in. You're going, oh, my goodness, I may have to change. I may have to change my thinking. That's the whole idea. Remember, transform you more like Christ. And in the book, I deal with what I call the five battlefields of the prophetic. There's five major battlefields. The battlefield of delay, the battlefield of doubt, the battlefield of no recognition. You think about Joseph had all those. The battlefield of misunderstanding. And then there's the battlefield of the prophetic crisis. But this whole thing works by the grace of God. So I'll just close with 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5.10. Peter got some great prophetic words, didn't he? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. You go, yeah, that's the kind of prophecies we want today, Clem. You know, these high-voltage, world-changing prophecies. And Peter went through some stuff. He called it himself the trying of his own faith. Peter went through battles with the enemy. And one time Jesus was looking at him and says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that was right, right in Peter's face. Like, get behind me, Satan. So here's Peter writing his first epistle, and here's how he closes it. The very end, chapter 5, verse 10, he says, and after you've suffered a little while, how many signing up for the suffering small group? <laughs> I think it starts tomorrow with the fasting. Anyway, <laughs> how many... How many love your brand new pastor and his leadership? Yes, say, pastor, we love you. That's your first test. This charge I give you, new life, fasting starts tomorrow. I just don't, I don't have a witness about, I'm not feeling it, Donnie. Not, but I'll pray about it. Maybe next Monday, 2025. Okay, and after you've suffered a while, Peter suffered. We need to embrace spiritual suffering. Okay? Paul even said, I want to know him. Right? What else did he want to know? The fellowship of his sufferings. Power of his resurrection. Yeah, that's... I want to know the fellowship, koinonia of his sufferings. So Peter said, look, after... Suffering is a severe human experience. We all go through them. We will go through them. But he says, after you've suffered a while, watch the God of all grace... The God of all grace. No matter what you go through, he's got grace. Amen. Peter used that back in chapter 4. He said, we're to be good stewards of God's varied grace, or manifold, the King James says. Manifold grace. You know what that means? Multicolored. Multicolored grace. He's got a grace to match every trial. James says, count it all joy when you fall into multicolored trials. It's the same Greek word. For every trial, God can match it with grace. Amen. So he says, after you've suffered a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, watch, will himself, four things, restore, 
That's the same word for equip, the equipping of the saints. In your suffering, God's equipping you by his grace. He will restore. He will confirm. Sterizo means, means to, to strengthen. To, and the idea of sterizo means to turn resolutely in a certain direction. Sometimes God's just got to turn you around, right? Don't you ever pray that? God just turned his life around. Okay, might take a little suffering. But after you suffered, there's grace to help turn you around, to strengthen you and establish you. That means put foundation in you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's so powerful. And Peter had to go through that to become who he was, to prepare him. So God's preparing an army. God's preparing us for battle. We're, how many feel like we're in the last of the last days? Yeah. yeah, we're in the last days. That started on the day of Pentecost, by the way. Or actually, when Jesus rose from the dead, the last days started. But I believe we're in the last of the last days. Yes. And it says perilous times will come. You can't ignore tumultuous, perilous times we are in. And Pastor, you and I were talking on the way over. It, it's getting darker. And sin is more glaring. Yeah. Things that we used to like, we didn't even really know about it. Now it's like right in your face. And you, you better not criticize me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's out there. So what kind of church does God want? Strong, courageous, full of commitment, full of motive and heart, right? Warriors that know how to battle with the right weapons. How many have ever had a prophetic word in your life? Come on, let me see your hands. Wow, that's a lot of you. That's because you brought that guy, Alan Ross, in here, didn't you? <laughs> Watch out for that Scottish guy. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have had prophetic words. So the first thing I want to encourage you is go back. Go back again. Maybe you haven't even had time to transcribe them yet. Go back, transcribe them. Go back. You'll be amazed how a prophetic can word, word can change just in a few months. It's all about the seasons. When you go through a change of seasons or something happens, you may get married or some relationship, you go back and look at a prophetic word and go, oh, that's what that means. Now I see it, God. So you go back and you keep waging warfare. You keep seeing yourself in it. And sometimes you're saying, God, I need another word. And he goes, we're not done with the previous ones yet. <laughs> Let's go back and finish here. Because you know what you're doing? When you say, I'd like another word, the other hand's going, and I'll, need, I'll take some more warfare. It will come. It's guaranteed. So you, 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 have to be, you have to be careful what you ask for. And you say, God, I need a prophetic word. He goes, no, you don't need warfare because you're going to get both. So right now I'm going to have mercy on you. And sometimes when God doesn't say anything in a season you're in, that is the prophetic word. In other words, just keep on keeping on. That's, that's kind of releasing, isn't it? He just releases you to keep doing what you're doing. I'm building Christ in you. You're doing well. But today's a new day. It's an exciting day, and I don't know if this was even planned when we talked months ago that I would be coming on this Sunday of transition. But I want to particularly pray for the, the two pastoral couples because the biggest transition and the biggest shift is happening right here in the front row, okay? And, yeah, you need to pray for them. That's, you, and, yes, fast and whatever God tells you to do, but you need to pray for them because it will go well with you, the Bible says. So it goes well with you. So I'm going to start at the top, work my way down, and we have a new top. <laughs> so we're going to start. See, isn't that different already? So Donnie, and what's your, what's your wife's name? Catherine. Catherine, come on, stand up here. And I want you to be listening because this is not just a prophecy for them. This is for the church. When God, whenever God speaks to the Angelos, like he did in the book of Revelation, seven letters to seven churches, they were spoken to the Angelos, the messenger, who is usually the pastor of the church, and so the whole church gets the word. So be listening for phrases. Be listening for instruction. Be listening for, for things that are going to resonate with you because eventually they can't do this without you. They can't carry out anything by themselves, and neither can you. We're the body of Christ. Step just a little closer here and pray for these two. Are, are we recording this? You guys in the back got it recorded? Okay. So good. Hallelujah. Do you have children? Two boys. They're in this. They're as much in this calling as you are. God's called your family, not just you, Brad. He's put the call on you, and that means he's put grace on you. There's going to be grace upon your sons. 
One of them is going to end up in ministry someday. Don't rush it. Don't push it. Just know it. <laughs> Believe it. And just tenderly pastor his heart. God will ordain his steps. It's going to be another season way down the road. But just know that this is a call to the family to shepherd the flock of God. Because, sister, you've got a lot of shepherding you're going to do. As an elder's wife, you're a pastoral team. Brother, sometimes she's going to out-shepherd you. <laughs> she's going to know things. She, she got that extra large t intuition. You're going to have to listen. Because God's going to tell her things about families and about people. And people that you thought you could trust. And she goes, I don't trust him. <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> he's got to prove himself. So you need, you know, you're going to work together in the spirit. You're going to shepherd together in the spirit. You're both going to be able to feed the flock of God at measure. Sister, you're going to be feeding women, feeding the saints. There's a whole group of young disciples coming under you. I'm going to call them like a development group, a, a, a group of young ladies who are hungry, a group of young ladies who need mentoring. They didn't have a mama. They came from a broken home. They're not even sure how to cook the family meal, and they're, they're insecure, and they're in fear. And you're going to just give them the practicalities. Good old Titus. We call it the Titus ministry. The older women teach the younger. You're not that old, but anyway, you'll be older than them. You'll be older than them. That's all. But the practicalities of life and doctrine are going to come flowing from your lips because God has developed a pattern of living in the two of you. Yes. It's not only even how well you exegete the scriptures, brother. It's how you live your life. Because mm. doctrine is your theology plus your lifestyle. Mm. And your doctrine is what you do. So you're going to live out your doctrine, strong doctrine. I want to say hard theology, not difficult to understand, impenetrable theology that cannot be broken, cannot be twisted, cannot be misinterpreted. This is what the Bible says. Set in stone like the Ten Commandments, but set into the hearts of men. You're going to be discipling men. Don't worry about the masses right now. The masses can get stuff on the internet. <laughs> okay? There's guys going to out preach you on, and me and, and Ian combined. Okay? Sunday's not a preaching contest. Sunday's a time to feed the sheep. But beyond that, you're going to make disciples. You're going to be strongly engaged with making disciples during the week. In fact, God's gonna, you're going to put more time in discipling than you are sermon preparation. Just steal Ian's old sermons. They'll, they'll work. <laughs> He's got tons of them, 40 years plus. Just say, hey, can I have a, you got, I, need a, I need a new series. Can I just borrow that one? So don't waste, not, not waste your time. Don't be buried in 30 or 40 hours a week of sermon prep. Mm. Make disciples. That's a great commission, right? He didn't say go into all the world and preach sermons. We do preach sermons, but go to all the world and make disciples. This is going to be a place where disciples are made. Amen. You got to make them. They don't make themselves. You got to make them. You're going to make disciples. Your sons are going to make disciples because you're making them into disciples. It's, it's called beyond parenting. <laughs> yes, you're parenting them, but don't forget you're making disciples. And that pattern, I'm going to go back to the word pattern. It's very important. God's going to give you a pattern to make disciples of men. God's going to give you, sister, a pattern for women. And together is going to give you a pattern for families. And God's going to put a pattern in this house that can be modeled and multiplied for the future. And it has nothing to do with the physical building. It's going to be what you do between the meetings at the physical building. It's where they take the word and put it into action. And it's going to be simple yet doable. Simplify it. I think the word for both of you is as you go into this next season, keep it simple. Our world is so cluttered. Our minds are cluttered. Our phones are running our lives. So keep it simple but doable and then measure it. And as you measure men and as you measure women and measure their lives, just help them. Great transparency. God is going to require from the two of you. Open book. All the messes, all the mistakes. Get them out now. They're going to find out later. <laughs> I'm just saying, people want transparency in their leaders. 
And you're, you're not ashamed of the gospel, so don't be ashamed of what the gospel's done for you. And it's rescued you, changed you, transformed you. And that's the message of the house. Now, there's an architecture that God is going to begin to download to you. Just like you stood up here and said, well, I was seeking the Lord about this next week. And so God's going to give you architecture on how to build this church. Because that's what Jesus is doing right now. Jesus said, what? I will build my church, right? What are you supposed to do then? You go make disciples. If you build people, Jesus can build the church. Just keep handing them building material. Got another one, Lord. Here you go. They're all yours. <laughs> Put them to work. And you just keep building people. And God's going to do something that's going to help the outreach efforts that sometimes have fallen flat and sometimes don't have enough fuel. God's going to refuel and retool your outreach strategies to reach more people. And there's another generation that you're going to be really wanting to target and welcome. Target them and welcome them. Make them feel safe. Make them feel welcome. Make them feel like they belong. Find out what they like to do. You need, a, you need like a round table of young people, like a young advisory council, and get around the table with them, and they all need to be way younger than you. But you need to say, talk to me. What? Talk to me about your friends. Why don't your friends want to come to church? What do your friends do on weekends? What kind of family life do your friends have? What are some of the problems? You're, and they're all talking. Oh, they're texting. They're talking. They're sharing, but not with adults because they're afraid. They're insecure. You're going to help break that off of young people by loving, welcoming, saying, we got a place for you. just a flicker of a fresh vision beginning there. When there's a major change like this, there's also a shift, a shift of vision. You can't change the Great Commission. That, that's, every church has that vision. But the particular vision God is going to begin to incubate in you will have to do with stretching your faith. And you're going to have to stretch your faith for buildings and for staff for more finances, this is how God stretches us. But you've got good mentors sitting on the front row, your spiritual father. You've got, you've got models that you can look. You can even go around England and check out some other models. Like, how does this work for you? How does that work for you? How do I do this? How do you do that? And ask questions. This new journey is a journey of inquiry for you. And just ask, ask people that have gone before you. How did you break that growth barrier? How did you do that? How did you get that loan? <laughs> How did you do that? And God is going to just give you instructors and tutors. He's going to make you look a lot smarter than you are, brother. Isn't that exciting? He's going to make you look really smart. It's like, boy, he's, our pastor's so smart. Yeah, he just keeps asking smarter people. And he actually listens to them. And he, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. Good old James 1.5. You'll live in James 1.5. Then if you lack wisdom, ask of God. You're going to spend a lot of time. You just have prostrate on your face. Asking God, just keep asking. Don't stop asking. How much more? <laughs> if you being earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, right? Mm -hmm. will, the Holy, will God give the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to those that ask? You got to keep asking. God, give me spiritual insight. Give me spiritual wisdom. I need your spirit. And just get deeply in love with the Holy Spirit because he will be your guide. He will be your guide. You'll do a little bit of traveling here and there, not a lot. You've got to stay close to the flock. But every now and then, there's going to be some strategic conferences that God will take you to. And I feel like you need to go together. There's some strategic traveling you'll do where God is going to download something. And it may not all be just a churchy conference. It might be some other kind of a leadership thing or something that you're going to uh, maybe it has to do with AI or maybe it has to do with the trends or something that's going to give you an edge. So you can understand what, where society is going. Yeah? We live in an existential time. The way life is being played out in the tw 21st century and what's being played out on our stage is rapidly changing and we've got to keep up. And you'll be able to keep up with the times. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless this couple, their family. Lord, make them a godly pattern of discipleship, not only for this house, but for those yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Pastor Ian, and your 
your bride. Diane, is it Diane? Yeah. Denise. Denise, sorry, I got three or four letters correct. <laughs> I've had them out of, stand right up here close. I'm just really short, so it makes me feel tall when I think you're <laughs> Stand a little closer, all right. How many love this couple? Yeah. Uh, you do better than that. Yeah. They love you, you're awesome. We should have gotten to know each other about 13, 14 years ago. Yeah. It's not fair. <laughs> all right, we'll make up for lost time. Oh, Father, we bless this truly a spiritual father and a spiritual mother in the house. Lord, we thank you, first of all, just for the years, and I don't want to try to outdo what you're going to do well next Sunday. But, God, they are at a pivotal time. They're in a time of transition, and they've been preparing for it. This is not taking you by surprise. You've actually kind of a little, there's a little flutter of excitement about what's next. And yet you don't want to hurry, but you don't want to miss God. And God says, son and daughter, you're not going to miss me at all. I'll keep you in, in a very specialized busyness, one that's fruitful. You're going to have fruitful days coming, high productivity with less effort. You're going to have, I want to almost say, you're going to, hmm, you're going to help fast track some leaders. Your, your days of shaping and forming leaders are not over, but it's going to be not effortless, but you're going to get more for your time. A one-hour coffee is going to transform somebody. Uh, a a, a, a 30-minute or a 30-second prayer, sis. One prayer is going to shift something in somebody. And so know that God says, I'm going to put weight on your words in this next season. Your words are going to be heavier, weightier. You, you know, in some ways, brother, you're free from <laughs> the image of the senior pastor. You're going to get away with some things. You can say some things. You say, well... Hey, I'm not the pastor anymore. I'm going to say it like I see it. <laughs> so, and he's such a nice guy, I can tell. But some of y'all need a little fatherly talk from Father Ian. There are some sons that you need to just help them. Help them mature quickly. Help them to put off things of the flesh. Help them to put off bad behavior. Just help, help it. Like a father would want to help one son. You're going to do that, brother. And you're going to do it gently, lovingly, in grace, but... I, I, I don't know if I'm going to get the right word. It's going to be forceful, full of the force of God's grace. Even pathetically, there will be some times you'll get a pathetic word. It doesn't have to be long like I am today. I'm kind of long, but you can give a short word, a short, pithy proverb that comes from your years and wealth of experience that just come rising up and condensed into one statement. Say, this is a key for you. Boom. I want to also say there's some other couples that have been in ministry that you're going to help restore. They've been beat up and bruised in ministry, and we all understand that. But there's a couple of pastors and their wives that you're going to help restore them back into ministry. And God's going to just put them right in your path. You don't have to scour the Internet for them. <laughs> Brokenpastors.com. Oh, there's too many. <laughs> Is there? <laughs> there's too many. Um, God is going to supernaturally hook you up, and you're going to just, you're going to know, say, we need to, we need to reach out to this couple. We, God wants to restore them. You're going to see such fruit, such joy. I want to say also there's some missionaries you're going to restore. There's some missionaries right now that are battling, and they don't feel pastored. You're going to actually pastor some missionaries. Some of the pastoral effort you put in the local church, now God's going to translocal your pastoral gift into some people out there. And it just might be a Zoom meeting. It just might be, how can we pray for you? But you're going to find yourself getting into their life a little more, and they're going to feel so safe off or opening up their life and their problems to you. And it, there's even times you say, come home, come to England, and we're going to put you up for a couple weeks, and we're going to minister to you. Just that generosity, that's in you. Yeah. You're, you're a very generous couple. I don't know you, but I, I sense great generosity in the both of you. And because of that, God says, be generous to my people. Be generous to my missionaries. Be generous to my other shepherds. Because a lot of them have been on the short end of generosity. <laughs> and it's wounded them. They don't think that their God in heaven cares. And God really does. And he wants to show that through the two of you. So you even do a little bit of traveling yet. Your, your suitcases aren't retiring. <laughs> you need to keep them ready to go. There will be some key trips that will just... Warm your heart and restore other people. And there's great joy coming. Hmm. 
I don't want to get too personal, but I, I really feel like there's, there's an unexpected payoff from an investment that you thought is either dead or gone or what's the use or why bother. I feel like God says, I'm going to pull a string in the future and just open the windows of heaven because you've been faithful. This isn't a prosperity prophecy. It's just it, what I would call it is a stewardship prophecy. You've been a good steward. And God says, I have promises for the two of you and for your future. And so uh, God is going to bless you. God is going to give you not only spiritual sons and daughters, but many spiritual grandsons and granddaughters. And uh, I know we talked yesterday, so I know you wrote some books. I had a little flicker yesterday. There could be one more. And the thing is, Ian, we cheat now. It's so fast with AI. You can write it. You can actually sit down and talk. <laughs> Basically just sit down and, and talk, and it turns into a book. So... There's just like little, little short, and they're not long, not these long things. They're going to be these little wisdom nuggets that you've learned over the years, and, and your, your, your companion here is going to help crack that. I almost feel like it's something you're going to do together. I think wisdom that you've learned in, in, you know, from ministry and all the other stuff, just because it's all about, I'm going to go back to what God said about this house, making strong disciples, strong families. In a, in a day of crisis, in a day of all kinds of chaos, God is going to continue to make quality disciples for the world to see and for the world to know, oh, how they love one another. How they love one another. It's the one mark of this house. I felt it walking in. I don't know who these people are, but I feel the love. The love of God is reigning supreme here. There are no strangers that come in the doors of this church, but you're going to make them feel so welcome they'll never want to leave. You need a bigger place. Come on. You, you know you do. Like right now, I, I, I like seeing a full room. I hate seeing a full room. You know why I hate seeing a full room? There's no room for anybody else. So I like it, but I hate it. Y'all are too full. That's good, though. So you need to stretch out your faith. That's why I'm prophesying this, this kind of in tandem here. It's not, it's not just like, well, Ian, if Ian would just do something, he should have had a building by now. It's not his burden. It's not Donnie, Danny, Donnie, Donnie, Danny, sorry. It's just not their vision, their burden. Y'all got to get behind it. See, this is the word for the church. When you start saying it together, God's going to give us another building. We got to keep looking. Because you need, why? You're going to reach more people. You got to make more disciples. They're out there. But you got to get them in. So, Father, enlarge the net of this house. Let this become a wider net. Give these brothers and the other elders and leaders strategy to enlarge the net to catch more fish, to bring the harvest in. It's harvest time, folks, and I can't give you the scripture, but it says when this, when this darkness comes and when this chaos comes, God rains down grace for harvest. It's harvest time. Yeah. Don't be distracted by the evil around you. Be encouraged that it's harvest time and God is separating the righteous and the wicked. It's happening right before your eyes. If you just look and go, that is so unrighteous. Yep, it's going to be so clear. There'll be no doubts and you're going to start reaping harvest upon harvest in the days ahead. So, Father, keep this couple. I can't say keep them young. I'd be a false prophet. No, I wish I, I pray. I, I try to prophesy over myself in my bathroom mirror. It doesn't work. So, anyway, I have a great... But God, keep them healthy and in your hands. Can you all agree for that? We just pray for holy health and God, stamina. But God, also give them great rest. Give them a rest well-deserved and a joy to their hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Can you say amen, church? Amen. amen. When I come to a church the first time, I like to start at the top and work down. And I'll be back sometime, but are your elders also? Yeah, come on up here. Again, why do you, why do, you do that? Because they're going to carry the weight of the prophetic words, and then you're going to be joining them. Y'all y'all with me? No pouting. No, like, when do I get my word? No, you, you want to be rejoicing going, our leaders are getting direction from God. They're getting encouragement. God's building our leaders because they're going to carry the vision. Amen? What's your name?
guy. Do you know? Doug Team. Doug Team. All right. Stand up here and look closer. All right. Father, we thank you for this couple. Oh, God, thank you. You brought them through. You went through a little bit of bruising. You went through some battles. But God says, you are whole, and you're going to bring wholeness to others. And the Lord says that even though you might have a little bit of a limp, God says, I do that on purpose like I did with Jacob. He walked with a limp because he wrestled with God. And, brother, you can boast in that. Oh, I've, I've had to wrestle with God over that. <laughs> and basically, we all say, and we lost, but I wrestled. And it's in the wrestling where you feel God's, not only his power, but you feel his affirmation. And, brother, God says, I affirm you today. You are my son. God affirms you. You're not weak. You're not incapable. You, you haven't been bruised beyond repair. God has been at your side, and he has got you in his hand. And there's some strength you're bringing to the leadership team. You're going to bring strength to Donnie. You're going to bring strength to the house, to the other men. Again, he can't disciple men all by himself. There's a lot of men in the room, and you got to keep raising them up. So you're going to get in on this discipleship track. It's going to take, take, a, take on a, an excitement in the church. And I, I, brother, you're, you're, a, you're a sharp like an accountant, brother, you know where the, you know where the, uh, you, you know where to cut the fluff. Like, you know, we need to, you need to cut expenses here. You know how to cut. You're going to help cut the things that people are wasting their time on. So you're going to do a forensic analysis of time in the house. And it's okay to speak up in an elders meeting and say, you know what, that, we don't really need to be doing that anymore. It's, it's not paying off. So you understand profit and loss. They say, there's no profit to that. That's, that's just an activity that burns energy, and we don't get anything out of it. So speak up, all right? God's saying, I'm giving you permission to speak up and take a look at the accounts of people's ministries and lives so that you can streamline the energy of the house into productivity. And sister, you, you're a worshiper. I just, I don't know. That's all I can say. And that's a huge word. It doesn't mean, I didn't say you're a singer. I said you're a worshiper. It goes beyond singing, sis. Worship is, is uh, uh, the way we respond when God reveals himself. You worship, and there's a shout in you and a hallelujah in you, and there's an amen in you, and there's a mm-hmm, and there's, oh, the mm-hmm. And when that mm-hmm gets going, it's like, oh, she's on to something. That's, you're worshiping. Hey, what's she doing over there nodding her head? She's worshiping. And that, that is, mm-hmm. Transformation. The, the worship you are experiencing even now is going to transform other people. You're going to get a revelation of Jesus in certain areas that's going to transform them and turn them into a worshiper. And that's what God wants. That's what the woman at the well, God is seeking those that worship. He didn't say, I'm seeking a choir. I'm seeking a, a musical team. He said, he's seeking those that worship him in spirit and truth. You love the Holy Ghost, sis. And that's what you call him. We say Holy Spirit sounds more refined, but good old King James people and good old Anglicans, he was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is powerful in your life. And I believe God wants to stir you up in your gifting. He wants you to stir yourself to see the manifestation of the Spirit when you're discipling, when you're praying for somebody. Believe God. Believe for the healings. Believe for the miracles. Believe for the word of knowledge. Believe, I'm going to say it, yes, even for demons to flee. <laughs> Sister, you're going to see people, what's holding some people back from worship is they got a false god inside of them. And it's just they got their eyes on the wrong gods. And you're going to set them free. You're literally going to see deliverance. That's, a, that's not a word to be afraid of if you're a disciple of Christ. He said, you're going to do that. Those that believe in me, they'll speak with new tongues and they'll cast out devils. Don't be afraid. You can't do it. Jesus can. You're going to see some people get set free, even, even as a couple. But there's some people you're going to see get set free because your discernment is going to rise. And you're going to say, they just need a prayer of deliverance. And it's not like an all-day seminar. You can just say, in Jesus' name. Jesus didn't say, uh, sign up for six months of counseling with the, our discipleship team. Jesus said, come out. Amen. He commanded them. He said, well, I'm just going to pray and we'll see if, no, he didn't pray. He just commanded them. Sister, there's a, there's a command inside of you. It's like that word, right, brother? Just ask him. There's a, 
you got the ability to command. Amen? And we all do. We all know how to command when we're under authority. That's the key. So you're a couple of authority. You're under authority. And God's going to grant you even more levels of authority to deal with demonic things, to deal with what we call strongholds, which is false thinking in people's minds, mm -hmm. and straighten them out so they can become a thriving disciple in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Anybody else? Can you pray for this? Are you a couple? I hope so. He's got his armor on. You know. Can you come? Some of you going, I knew we should have sat up front this morning. I knew it. He's only calling from the front. Just wait. Just wait. Come, come over this way just a little bit. And what's your name? Leo. Leo? Yes. And what's your name? Adriana. Adriana. Thank you for playing today. Awesome. And you? I saw you ripping them a couple times. You were holding back, weren't you? I'll bet when you're alone, it's a whole different sound. And God... He loves the both of you, just, not just because you're part of the worship team, but he loves your journey. Brother, you've hung in there, uh, and it's, it's very fitting you have your arm around your wife because you have protected her. Brother, you are a protector by nature. Uh, you love to protect the innocent. You love to protect the, the weak. You've been called to help protect some of the sheep in the house, and there's some young men you're going to protect. There's some very vulnerable hurting, afraid young men, and you're going to protect them. You're going to give them assurance. You're going to even be like a substitute father in their life where they've had no fathering because there was a time when you, you kind of even challenged your own relationship with father. But God says, I've healed that. I've, I've become your father. And because of that, you're going to want to father some young men. You want to recreate their image of God the Father through what you do with your heart and what you do with your hands. Brother, your hands are not only skilled with a guitar, they're skilled with other things too. You have very skilled hands. Brother, you're going to make some money with those hands. God's going to bless the work of your hands. And that's also a way you're going to help disciple some young men. You're going to teach them what to do some stuff with their hands. If you get a young man's hands busy, then he, he doesn't have time to be an idiot. He's too busy working with his hands, right? Build this, just clean up that. Here, put a shovel in their hands. Keep their hands busy, and then their head doesn't get in the way. It doesn't come up with the, the crazy ideas that young men come up with. You're going to help disciple and mentor. That's just your calling. And in very practical ways, put some, put some men to work. Just put them to work. Make up a job. Just go, go move that for me. <laughs> just get them, get them in your life, and then encourage them and, and coach them and say, that was great. And Hey, why don't you try it this way next time? And this is what I learned when I was your age. Oh, the, all these words are going to come out of encouragement. You are like a Barnabas, a son of consolation, an encourager. And that's because God has so come and put encouragement inside of you. There was a time you got a lot of negativity. There was a lot of negative words spoken, and God has so turned that around. And he says, that's not how I talk. That's what, not what I call you. I call you my son. God's very proud of you. Do you have children? Yeah. Musicians? So I was going to say, that just the, what a musical house. And we give a lot of credit to Mama here. You're the one that makes him practice. <laughs> he just likes to freelance, but you said, you need to learn your scale. You need to do this, this, this. So the discipline of musicianship is going to also pay off in other areas of your children's lives. And um, it's easy sometimes to get into a, like, I just want to play in a band the rest of my life. Well, that's, that's, there's more to your kid's life than just music. There's, there's education. There's teaching ability in your children. God just got great career paths for your children. You keep praying and you keep coaching. How old are your children? Are they, like, in their 20s? So they're adults. Yeah. So they're, they're, um, they're not, um, they, they, I just want to say this. They haven't fully stepped into their Full, the fullness of their careers. Um, there's God has advance and promotion coming for them. But it's what you've built into them as children is what's going to pay off later in their adult life. And that's why I said just keep praying because God has things he's going to do in their lives because you've prayed, you've done your job, now you just finish on your knees. <laughs> we continue to parent on our knees when they get old enough. So, Father, we thank you. Sis, there's, 
if there's any concern about health issues, God's going to touch your body. Amen. If there's any fear, maybe something that this is going to get passed down from my family or this or that, God says no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. God loves you, and God's going to take care of your body. He's going to give you wisdom. You might need to take a pill or something, but God will give you wisdom for your health. Amen. Wisdom for your health so you do not fear that you can charge forward. Amen. Wow. Amen. Do you, are you working full time? Do you work? You're, no? I just feel like there's a type of a job. That's why I said you're going to go forward into some kind of a, I'm going to call it a job, but it may not be a paying job, but there's a, there's a function. You're going to step into this new. And it's going to touch some people. And it's even going to, you're even going to have a, you're going to be, hmm, you're going to have opportunities to share your faith. It won't be a closed type of situation where you're forbidden to talk about Christ or Christianity. You're just going to suddenly say, I've had all these people I can talk to Jesus about. God's just going to open an amazing door to very needy people. And you're going to be able to share the best news of all. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. Yeah. So there is, all right, two more. A gentleman with a little gray hair like me, and a blue sweater on. I'm looking right at you. Yep, you just turned and looked. You talking to me? Yeah. Yeah, is, is, you have a wife or with you? Spouse there? Yeah, both come on up. And then right behind you, there's a tall young man right there. You got your hand up to your mouth, I think. Is that a girl, boy? I can't see. Who is that? Come on up here. Oh, my gosh, he's tall. Look at that. <laughs> Come on up here. So I'm going to pray for you. Brother, if you're any tall, you can even fit in the room. You're, <laughs> come on, why don't you stand right here? I'm going to pray for you in a minute. And what's your name? Robert. Robert? Robert. And Robert. Yvonne. Yvonne, all right. Pillars. Mm. Strong pillars in the church, ones that can bear spiritual weight, ones that are ringing so loud and clear about these words about disciples and that. It's your heart. You long to see the fulfillment of that vision. And you're here to help that. You're here to help fuel it. You're here to, I just feel like there's a season. It's not perpetual and forever. There's a season you're going to open your home up and have some couples in and have some fellowship and have some discipleship right in your home. Your home is a ministry center. It's not just a house. It's not just where you do biological life. There's ministry that comes out of your home. Sister, there's a lot of prayer that comes out of your home. You are a prayer warrior. You've got prayer genes. I've never used that term before, but you've got prayer genes that come from generations. And you, have, you understand the power of prayer. You've seen the results of prayer. And, and brother, there's, a, there's some men that uh, even in, in our later years, they're still lost and it's burdening you more. And the older you get, the more you see them getting old too. And there's just some key longtime friends don't know Christ yet. God says, don't give up. Don't give up on them. Always pray. But God says, I'll open a door. You just don't give up. And you're going to see some real fruit in your latter years. Again, you're a kind of a model. When I talk about pattern to the pastors, you're also a pattern of living that God wants to showcase you a little more. God wants to Get some people in your home and get, get you guys to open up the wisdom, the book of wisdom. You, your, your lives are a book of wisdom. And you'll, you'll go back even 20, 30, 40 years and say, I remember when, and then I learned this, and then God taught me this, and then God brought us through this. Tell the story. Your story is amazing. You may think it's kind of not that glamorous, but you know what? There's so many God moments in your story. God says, I want you to tell people. That's why I allowed them to happen. So I brought you this far. There's even a couple of miracles you're believing God for. I don't know if it's a relative or somebody close that really needs a miracle. They need a touch from God. And God says, I want to get the glory there. And I want you to receive the joy of being involved in that in prayer and not giving up. This whole thing about holding faith and a good conscience, hold faith, hold faith. There's even promises you're still holding on to. Well done. I just feel like God wants to say, well done. I, I took you on the long path. So you can encourage others when they're on a long path. Say, don't give up. The, the word, if there's one word you guys can say to other people, don't give up. Don't quit. 
God hasn't quit. <laughs> Amen. And you're not a quitter, brother. There's some, there's some new things you're going to do. I, I hate to say this, but it comes to me this way about, you know, the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're not an old dog, brother. <laughs> you're not an old dog. You're going to learn some new spiritual tricks. You're even going to learn some, some techniques on how to witness. Evangelism is not worn out and old and outdated. Evangelism is as fresh as the word of the Lord in your mouth because it's called the good news. It, it means to proclaim, to preach even, to herald something good. And there's some people you're going to be around. You just got to tell them what the greatest news on the planet ever was. It's still the gospel that saves. So you're going to see days of salvations, days of even some healings, days where generations are going to be uh, stimulated and kind of reaping where others have sown for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Bless you. Come over here. He's still taller than me. He's even taller than me now. What's your name? Junior? How do you spell it? Junior. Get my British accent scamming you. Come on. Sorry, Junior. You're awesome. You only play, don't play sports? Yeah, you're a sports guy. My wife would have already recruited you. She played college sports. She was always looking for athletes. And, um, but that's, you're, you're going to be an athlete in action for Jesus. You're going you're gonna to have a lot of times of action. But here's the thing. God is tempering you on the inside. God is going to teach you how to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit when you're in tense moments and when you're in pressure situations because athletes like that. They like challenge, they like competition, they like pressure, they like down to the last second, but God is going to, you're just going to be cool. Amen. Who's that? That's Junior, we call him Cool Junior. <laughs> He's just cool. And they're going to say, why is he, he doesn't get as ruffled, he doesn't get angry like the others. He, we can't get at him, even when guys try to poke you and prod you and tease you and call you names and you're just cool. So really, it's the Jesus factor, Junior, that you draw on because he was brutalized and he was called names and religious people hated him. And then you know what they did <laughs> on Good Friday. You need to refresh the Easter story. It's coming up. So get back in the Gospels and reread that Easter story for yourself and just say, Jesus, you did that for me. I can do this for you. And he, he, he suffered for us. When I said earlier, the Apostle Paul said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And I, I don't like to prophesy and talk about suffering, it's, but it's in the Bible. And I'm not, this is not a doom and gloom prophetic word for you, Junior, but you're going to understand the fellowship of his sufferings, the his sufferings. That makes our, our sufferings like nothing. And that's going, to be, that's going to be inside of you from this day forward. You say, yeah, but that's nothing compared to what Jesus went through. You're going to say that over and over. Yeah, but that's nothing compared to what Jesus went through for me. And you're going to hear that inside, not just as a, as a, a mantra that you come up with. That's going to be the Holy Spirit and just loving you. Because he says, I did that for you, Junior. I went to the cross for you. If this room was empty, it was just you and me, Jesus would say, I went for you and Clem. <laughs> I went to the cross just for you. And there's a personalization of the gospel coming into your life like never before. It's just a new season. Even this prophetic word is switching something on of your spirit that's going to connect you to the story of the gospel, the good news. And it starts with the bad news, all have sinned. So when you're around playing ball with sinners and they're all out there, <laughs> you just got to remember, I'm just, all have sinned. But the gospel is the grace of God in action. That's why you're going to be an athlete in action. You're going to take grace and run with it. Amen. You're going to run with grace. You're going to play with grace. You're going to speak. The day's going to come. The day's going to come. Because of what you're going to do with your body in athletics, God's going to open doors for you to be a speaker. You're going to speak at some school assemblies. You're going to speak at some training camps. You're going to have an opportunity to speak. And somebody can say, and we need someone to, to speak or do this. Just like, like, see, like I just forced your hand up. The Holy Spirit's going to go, and you're going to go, no, no, not me. And the Holy Spirit's going, yep, yep, yep. And you're going to just say, okay, I'll do it. And a couple of 
stimulations are going to happen when you volunteer. Put a microphone in your hand. You got to start getting used to that. You're going to have microphones in your hand. You might be giving an interview. You might be saying, how'd you score so many points? That's the glitzy side of it, right? But there's going to be other times you're going to just speak a message of hope. And you're going to have to give your testimony. Last thing I want to say is, you know, in Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame him, the devil, the enemy. We all have one by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And then the last part we don't like, but they loved not their own life unto the death. Personal death is going to be your friend. Just dying to self. That means dying to what you want. It's going to make you all that God wants. God's got a great destiny for you. You've got a lot of ambition. You've got a lot of hopes and dreams. But you just need to know it's got to be the grace of God and not just human effort. You've got enough human effort to get kind of to get by. But in the times of suffering and in the times we've got to embrace personal death and in those times when you're doing spiritual warfare, it's the grace of God that's going to take you where he wants you to go. And you will get there. And don't even worry about who you're going to marry now. You're not even, don't go there. Close that door and keep it closed because God is going to surprise you and you don't have to work for it. You don't have to go online. You don't have to search the internet. Just keep the door closed and God is going to bless you and bless you and bless you in marriage. Amen. Which, which pastor? Praise the Lord. Well, when we connected with Clem, as you know, who is a teacher and a prophet, we booked him for three days. And uh, prophets come to build the church. So the church is being built with, through these prophecies. Amen. But also there is ministry tomorrow uh, because, you know, she's going to minister to more people. There'll be more teaching on the prophetic. It's a whole world uh, of uh, knowledge. Uh, there's books that thick, several books about the prophetic. So there's a lot more to learn. And our brother will be ministering tomorrow and on Tuesday, 7 o'clock over here, okay? And as the Lord leads him, he will minister to people and 